Hello there. Welcome to the Saraway channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing remarkably well. And I hope you're going to go and get yourself something lovely and warm and comforting in order to soothe away the cold out there because I know that it's been very cold for many of us. But if you're living in a hot part of the world, then go and get something refreshing to drink. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, Veronica Westland had hoped that moving to the Catskill Mountains with her seven-year-old son Ethan would be an excellent new start for the both of them, the brand new beginning that mother and son both needed to repair the brokenness in their lives. If the truth be told, Veronica doubted she could be fixed again. She could relate to the character of Humpty Dumpty in the children's books that all the king's horses and all the king's men could not put back together again. The story she had read to her son that had caused him great upset was symbolic to her own life. Why couldn't they put Humpty Dumpty together again? Her son had asked her through earnest wide blue eyes. Well, sweetheart, some things are so broken they can't be fixed. Do you remember when Mummy dropped her favourite mug and it shattered all over the place? Ethan nodded with a sombre expression on his face. You were so very upset, Mummy, because it was your best mug. You tried to glue it together, but you couldn't. You loved that mug so much because Grandpa Pups gave it to you. I did love it, didn't I? But it didn't work. Try as I might, I could not fix it, could I? It was so shattered. I had to throw it away. I suspect it was like that for poor Humpty Dumpty. A tear spilled down Ethan's cheeks. Poor Humpty Dumpty, he cried out. Poor, poor Humpty Dumpty. No one could fix him, not even the king's men. Humpty Dumpty must have been so sad, Mummy. I'm sure he was very sad, but he was just too broken to be fixed. There was nothing anyone could do about it. Veronica knew she was also broken, so the children's book character of Humpty Dumpty touched a raw nerve for her. I just have to learn to adapt to a whole new life without my husband, she told herself. In truth, the thought of a life without Greg was like Christmas without the lights, the tinsel, the Christmas carols, the festive fair. When the couple had both got married, they fitted together so perfectly, like two pieces in a jigsaw puzzle, that complemented each other and belonged together. Greg was useless at all things domesticated, but was excellent with his hands, very resourceful, and could fix anything from a broken light bulb to an overflowing sink, while Veronica was your quintessential domestic goddess, who thoroughly enjoyed managing the house and being a mother to her son. Greg had been much more outgoing, whereas Veronica had often been a little reticent, so they brought out the very best in each other. Every day without him in her life, her heart would ache. The pain was so physical, as the mind influences the health of the body. They are clearly interlinked. She missed him so much. And how did you tell a seven-year-old child that his father was never, ever coming back? Why is Daddy not coming back? He had asked her. Because, sweetheart, remember when I told you about how Humpty Dumpty couldn't be fixed because he was so broken? Well, that's exactly what happened to your father. When we were driving to the Catskills and the car ploughed into that big truck, your father was badly broken. The doctors could not put him together again. So he had to go to heaven to get a brand new body. And that's where he's living now. It's a very beautiful place and he's having a fabulous time there. We'll see him one day when our bodies also break. We also have to go to heaven for an upgrade. Do you understand what I'm saying? Is Humpty Dumpty in heaven with Daddy now? Of course he is, and they both have brand new bodies. So Humpty Dumpty is finally fixed. Ethan seemed pleased that his dad would be spending time in heaven with his favourite storybook character Humpty Dumpty, and he gave his mother a big smile, which made her heart melt like butter. She loved it when Ethan smiled. It lit up his whole face and made him look just like Greg. Her son looked so much like her deceased husband. The same dark hair, the same warm honey complexion, the same blue-grey eyes, and the same cute little dimples. 
There was no doubt that the harrowing effects of the last few months still haunted Veronica's darkest nightmares. And despite all the trauma counselling she'd received, the graphically visual images of that inauspicious night so cruelly trespassed in her mind like a worm burrowing through an apple, simply refusing to abate. Why wouldn't those memories go away? Why couldn't she forget everything that happened that night? Why was it so conspicuously translucid in her mind, as if she was looking through a pane of glass, so that she recalled every last detail, every smell, every sound, every thought? By all accounts, most people involved in a traumatic event forgot everything, and that was a good thing. How often did you hear of people involved in a near-fatal car accident, and you'd find they never regained the memory of the event? Why couldn't it be like that for her? Veronica would love to forget, but forget she could not. The tormenting video recorder in her mind that would switch on at the most inopportune times would play the awful nightmare in her head back again to her, again and again and again. It could happen when she was in the supermarket buying the groceries or having coffee with a friend in town. When that happened, her body would become as cold as ice. Her pulse would race frantically and she would feel as if she was about to pass out. On one occasion she'd fainted by the delicatessen counter in the supermarket and had woken to find all these strangers hovering over her, like helicopters, with concerned, bewildered faces, asking her if she was all right, did she need a glass of water. She had felt so self-conscious, lying there on a supermarket floor, with all the passing customers stopping to have a good old gawk. Some kind old dear had taken pity on her and helped raise her up to her feet, while an ambulance had been called to ferry her off to hospital. The doctors explained she'd experienced some kind of a panic attack. She and her husband Greg, her beautiful, beautiful husband Greg, the quintessential love of her life, with his broad, wicked smile and cute little dimples on either side of his cheeks, had been happily talking away in their white high undie together. It had been a blissfully beautiful night, for driving out on the open road, the traffic had been light. Ironically, they were leaving New York to journey to the Catskills for the weekend, when the fortuitous accident had happened. Her husband Greg adored the Catskills. It was their go-to, very special place when they wanted to escape the bars of the city. It was easily accessible from New York, and a wonderful weekend retreat. A place where many New Yorkers gravitated to when they were looking for a much-needed country break. The locals didn't appreciate the influx of New Yorkers with their annoying liberal ideologies and their pompous superiority. But they liked their money, as it contributed greatly to the economy. I'd love to buy a house in the Catskills, her husband would say. A home away from home. It was an idea that was beginning to blossom in their minds. Ethan had been sleeping in the back of the car, and they could hear his tiny little snores, and they'd been listening to some kind of radio quiz. We have Martin here, phoning from Greenwich City, said the quiz show host. How are you doing, Martin? I'm great, Larry. How are you? Never better, Martin. Never better. So are you ready to answer some questions for us tonight? How are you with your general knowledge? I'm not sure. I'll give it my best shot, sir. I can't say that I'm actually very good. Good for you, Martin. That's all we can expect of you. If you get four questions right this evening, then you'll be forwarded on to the next quiz tomorrow night. Do you understand? And the one who gets all eight questions right will be the winner and has the opportunity of winning a fabulous cash prize. How does that sound? Good, sir. I'm up for the challenge. Well, here we go, Martin. These are the first four questions you need to get right. If you get one wrong, you're eliminated from the competition. Fair enough. Good luck, Martin. Now let's get started. What is the longest river in the United States? That's question number one for you tonight. The second one is, who was the first president to occupy the White House? Question number three is, what is the smallest American state? And question number four is, what is the most popular national park in America? 
These are your questions. You've got three minutes to answer them. Your time starts now. The longest river in the United States, Veronica asked her husband. What is it? I think it's on the tip of my tongue. I'm sure I know what it is. Ah, let's see. The longest river in the United States. Is it the Yukon River? No, I think it might be the Missouri River. No, it's definitely the Missouri River, said Greg. But are you sure? asked Veronica. What about the Mississippi? The Mississippi is huge. No, it's definitely the Missouri River, her husband had replied most insistently. Then it happened, and Veronica remembered it so vividly. These bright lights came barreling towards them. A truck driving on the wrong side of the road. There was no time to react, no time to get out of the way. Veronica heard her husband say, What the F? Time just seemed to stand so still, as if this moment was stuck in a time warp. One thought flashed into Veronica's mind, and one thought alone. We're going to die! We're going to die! There was no way they could survive this. No way! Not with a truck like that, manoeuvring towards them at such a speed. There was a loud, thunderous crash, a shattering of glass, a buckling of metal. A feeling of being thrown around, like the whirling dizziness you get on a roller coaster. Her head swung forward, then everything went completely black. But Veronica remembered a violently oppressive, coppery smell, and had haunting memories of figures standing over her, and a voice saying to her, Ma'am, ma'am, we're taking you to hospital now. Everything's going to be just fine. I'm Robert. I'm from the emergency services. She had grown. She felt hands on her, people's voices muttering and murmuring as they talked to each other. What about the driver? She vaguely heard someone saying, He didn't make it, I'm afraid. She had wanted to scream, open her eyes, but she was locked in the hazy oblivion of her physical incarceration, where her body throbbed in pain. She could taste blood swirling in her mouth and her body becoming weaker and weaker, until she remembered nothing at all. A day later she'd woken up in a hospital bed at the New York Presbyterian Hospital, feeling disorientated and confused. Where the hell was she? I'm in hospital, she thought, surveying her clinical environment with a degree of trepidation. The tubes were attached to her body to monitor her vitals. How did she get here? What happened? I must have been involved in some kind of an accident. She had heard a shuffle of footsteps and a nurse whispering to the doctor. I think our patient's awake now, Doc. Veronica had seen the handsome young doctor walking towards her bed. Hello, Mrs. Westland. I'm Dr. Murray Riesling. How are you doing today? I, I don't understand. Why am I in hospital? Where is my husband, Greg? Where is Ethan, my son? Her voice became frantically urgent. You were involved in a car accident, Mrs. Westland, which is why you're in the New York Presbyterian Hospital. Your husband was driving his white Hyundai. Do you remember what happened? Veronica shook her head. I don't remember anything. Well, unfortunately, a drunk driver was driving on the wrong side of the road. He was driving a very sizable lorry, I'm afraid. He ploughed straight into your vehicle. My husband! What about my husband, Greg? said Veronica. My son! They're all right, aren't they? They didn't get hurt, she said, her voice growing hysterical. I'm sorry, Mrs. Westland. There is no easy way to tell you. Your husband did not survive his injuries. But if it's any consolation to you, he was killed instantly. He didn't suffer any pain. No! No! He's not dead! He can't be! He can't! What about my son? Oh, my God! What about my son? Your son, Mrs. Westland, is absolutely fine. He's doing very well. He's been thoroughly checked out by the hospital and is currently being taken care of by your mother. They'll be visiting you shortly. It would seem that Veronica had suffered from a mild concussion, a perforated lung and several other injuries that weren't too problematic. But she had made a miraculous and full recovery, and thankfully Ethan had barely even acquired a scratch. But even though he was physically unharmed, 
He had not been unaffected by his father's death, for he had screamed when he had seen the pulverized state of his father's body. But Veronica had been reassured by the therapist, given his young age, that he would likely soon forget the traumatic event. Don't you worry yourself, Mrs. Westland. Kids your son's age are remarkably resilient in my experience. You mark my words, when he's older, he'll likely not remember a thing. Time is a remarkable healer, you know. If there were any saving graces for Veronica, her husband had fortunately taken out a hefty life insurance policy so that Veronica could move to the Catskill Mountains and take some time to evaluate her life, take stock of things, grieve the loss of her husband, and come to terms with the whole new trajectory of her life. The trauma of the last six months was still so brutally fresh in her mind, and sadly her temporary amnesia had not lasted for very long, as all the chilling memories came flooding back, like an overflowing smelly toilet that you really did not want to address. It was a therapist who had suggested that she made a fresh start. We can have our therapy sessions online twice a week, he told Veronica, but move away from New York. Get some fresh country air and exercise. I believe it will help facilitate your healing remarkably. With your husband's life insurance policy, you won't need to work, and you can use this invaluable time to heal. Veronica had viewed a house online in the Catskill Mountains that she'd fallen in love with at first glance. The Laurels was the name of the property, situated on an extensive wooded lot that overlooked a fabulous creek. The house was a circa 1890s double-storey white house, with tall sash windows, dark navy blue shutters, a flat roof, along with a bright red front door with a wraparound porch to the rear of the property that overlooked spectacular views over the Catskill Mountains. There was a stable block and some outbuildings that looked to be in excellent condition. It was only an hour's drive from the Catskill village. It was the perfect location for mother and son, she thought. But darling, Veronica's mother had said to her, why on earth would you buy a property that you haven't actually seen yet? Surely you can't get the full measure of the place without seeing it first. If you ask me, it's a ridiculous thing to do. What would Greg say if he was alive? Greg would be happy for us, Mum. I saw the property online. I got a building surveyor in the Catskills to examine it for me. He assured me it's an excellent nick. Everything is in perfect condition. Susanna Simmons did not look impressed as she studied her daughter scathingly over her cappuccino coffee at their favourite coffee shop in Manhattan. Her expression was withered, like a deflated flower in a vase that was surrendering to its fate, not very gracefully, I have to say. Honestly, darling, I think it's very unwise to buy a property so impulsively. I don't know how you could do it. Mum, if I didn't act with haste, I would have lost the place. Don't you understand that? The estate agent warned me that far too many people were sniffing around the property with a very keen interest. If I didn't snap it up quickly, I would regret it. I know I would. Sometimes, Mum, when something is meant to be, you just know it, and you grab it with both of your hands. Of course the estate agent would say that to you, darling. Honestly. You really know nothing about salespeople, do you, dear? That's how they work. They always give you the impression that hundreds of people are chomping at the bit to buy a property in order to get you to bite the bait so that they get the quick sale they want. For all you know, there could be a leak in the roof, warped floorboards, dry rot, an infestation of termites or roaches. You have no idea what they're selling you. Buying a house online has got to be the most nonsensical decision you've ever made, sweetheart. I'm sorry, but it needs to be said. I have to say it. There is no point in sugarcoating things. You've inherited a sizable life insurance policy, but you've got to be so careful, sweetheart, on how you spend it. I've heard of lottery winners who won millions now ending up on state benefits because they blew everything up. Look, Mum, from what I can see, the place is perfect for us. I was able to take a virtual tour of the property online so I could see everything. A lot of people buy properties this way. 
I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm certainly going to be careful with my insurance payout. You don't have to worry about that. I've got a very good financial adviser. I hope you do, dear, said her mother, looking doubtful. Do you know why the previous owners sold up? Veronica shrugged her shoulders. It's none of my business. I don't really care why they sold up. Oh, but it is your business, dear. It's always important to know why people are selling. Maybe the upkeep of the place was too expensive. Maybe the house was too far away from the village. I mean, it's an hour's drive. That's a long drive, if you ask me. Well, maybe they wanted to leave the Catskills. And that's another thing, dear. Wouldn't it have been better to be closer to town? I mean, what about little Ethan? What about Ethan? Well, he needs to go to school, doesn't he? To mix with other children his own age. I've decided to homeschool him for a while, until he's up to attending a school. He's still traumatised by the accident. I don't think he's ready to attend school yet. Besides, he's still very young. Why do I feel, sweetheart, that you're running away from everything? Said her mother, looking at her through hooded blue eyes. I'm not running away, Mum. I'm just going to live in the countryside to heal, much like an author may go to a secluded, quiet place to write their novels, away from the trappings of civilization, where they can't get distracted by the telephone perpetually ringing, and a hundred and one demands that can entice them away from their work. Oh, goodness gracious, darling, listen to yourself. You're not an author, sweetheart. All I can say is I hope you know what you're doing. I want to get away, Mum, from the hectic chaos and the busyness of New York. It's simple, as simple as that. It's not complicated. As I keep saying, Veronica, dear, I hope you know what you're doing. I happen to disagree with your therapist. You're not in a good place to make cognitive decisions at the moment. I don't know what the heck he's doing, telling you to bog off to the country without so much as a buy or leave. It's completely ridiculous if you ask me. I told you I'm going to have therapy sessions with him online. I ask you, Veronica, what on earth is wrong with this generation? I just don't understand it at all. I'm going to do this online. I'm going to buy a house online. I'm going to have a meeting online. I'm going to meet a boyfriend online. I mean, it doesn't strike me as a reasonable way to socially interact. A week later, Veronica and her son Ethan settled down in their beautiful home in the laurels in the Catskill Mountains without much going awry. Veronica felt as if her husband, although not physically with her, had guided her to buy this place. It was incredulous to think she'd got the house online, and even the men from the removal van company, who had unloaded all her furniture and helped her to place it strategically throughout her house, had said, Ma'am, I have to say to you, you have a very beautiful place here. I wish I could live in an area like this. You're exceedingly lucky. The views are fabulous. Ethan was in his element, cycling around the countryside on his little bicycle and industriously exploring the woodgrove. What was there not to like about living in this part of the world? Veronica could feel the heaviness of the oppressive hopelessness that had suffocated her for so long lift off her shoulders like a light hot air balloon floating away in the sky, as if for the first time in ages she could actually breathe. How she wished Greg was with her. He'd have loved this house in the Catskills, but he is here, she told herself. I may not feel him around me, but I know he's watching over us. Two months later, it was an early spring when Veronica could feel her son slipping into bed with her, something he only did if he was having a nightmare. These unsettling events were common after Greg's death, but since they had moved to the Catskills, they had become significantly less and less. Veronica took her seven-year-old boy in her arms. Are you having a bad dream, sweetheart? she asked, stroking his forehead tenderly and staring into his scared-looking blue eyes that were as wide as teacups. Is it about your father? It will get better, I promise you. Ethan shook his mane of sleek, dark hair and said, No, it's not about Daddy. It's about the very big, hairy man outside in the yard. He was waving at me, Mum. He was indicating for me to go outside to see him. He was scary, Mummy. Big, really big. 
You must have had a nightmare, sweetheart, said Veronica, cradling her son in her arm and rocking him gently. It's going to be all right, I promise you. There's no big hairy man outside. It's your imagination playing tricks with you, like the elves you used to believe lived under your bed. Don't you remember that? It wasn't tonight, ma'am, mummy. It was real. There's a great big hairy man, mummy, in the yard. He's as big as a small tree and he's very wide. He's covered in hair, mummy, just like a bear. I saw him walking around. He was swinging his arms a lot. It's going to be fine, sweetheart, said Veronica. Just fine. Now you get to sleep. She noticed her son seemed agitated, but he always became like this when his nerves were rather frayed and he was predisposed to having a vivid imagination. That was when Veronica heard a strange banging sound that sounded like the wind beating against an open door. She could hear the creak, creak, creak sound and then a bang. But there was no wind outside to explain the banging sound that sounded like a door bolting against the eaves or windows and their shutters banging open. Then she heard thumping and the curiously bizarre sound of ponderous heavy feet drumming the ground as if something very substantial in size was mulling around the interiors of her property. Surely not. She sat up with a start, her trembling body becoming rigidly stiff and very alert as her ears judiciously tuned in to the sounds of the house. She heard more bumps, a strange dragging sound, followed by the occasional bang and creak. What the hell was that? Her blood ran cold, and then it occurred to her that she might have forgotten to bolt the front door. Had someone broken into her house? Maybe they had tried the door and just let themselves in. She knew the cat skills had a growing problem with opioids and heroin. Could a drug addict be breaking into the properties out in the countryside to support their habit? They'd certainly be easy targets, she thought. She knew that drug addicts would stop at nothing to steal whatever they could for cash in order to acquire their next high. Had someone broken into her house? It certainly sounded like it. Should she phone 911? No, that would be silly, especially if no one was in the house. She'd feel like a fool calling the police if nothing was actually going on. Maybe a raccoon had got in through the half-open kitchen window. There had to be a rational explanation for the strange noise. Maybe the big hairy man is in the house, said Ethan, burying his head into her nightdress. Maybe he's going to hurt us, Mummy. He was so big. I saw him. I told you he waved at me. He was acting very friendly. Don't be silly, sweetheart, said Veronica, her voice unable to disguise its nervous quiver. She climbed out of bed. I need you to stay there, she said. I don't want you to move, do you understand, Ethan? I must just check out that noise. I'm sure it's absolutely nothing to worry about, she said, rummaging into the drawer of her nightstand for the revolver, which she tried to hide from her son's steely gaze. But it was too late. He'd seen it. What do you need a gun for, Mummy? You've got a gun in your hands. Are you going to shoot the hairy man? He asked, his eyes growing wide with horror. I'm not shooting anyone, Ethan. I'm taking the gun with me for safety reasons. Just to make sure we're all right. Now you must stay exactly where you are. Do you understand? Ethan nodded. I'm scared, Mummy. I don't want to be left alone. You must stay where you are, Ethan. Do you understand? Yes, Mummy. Good boy. Veronica could feel the heat rising up in her body. Her cheeks burned like two red hot coals. Something was in her house. She could sense it. She had her cell phone in her pocket at the ready to call the emergency services if the need arose. Veronica's heart pounded so loudly in her ears that it drowned out any other noises in the house. She discreetly crept down the staircase, holding the revolver tightly in her clammy hands that had become so slippery that the revolver was sliding around in her fingers. The first thing she saw when she tiptoed towards the passage was that the front door was wide open. It was swinging gently on its hinges, banging noisily against the outside wall as gusts of cool air trespassed invasively into the house like an unwelcome guest. Oh my God, she thought, someone's in my house. They must have discovered the door wasn't locked. Why did I forget to lock the door? How could I have been so forgetful? A dreadful fear seized her, like a powerful hand pinning her down to the spot, holding her captive to its forceful hold. 
Her body became rigidly stiff, as if everything inside her, from her jaws to her legs, had tightened significantly, so much that she could barely move. Is this what fear did to your body, she wondered, completely incapacitated you? She fought against her body's resistance to move forwards, as if she was treading water, and tiptoed through the house as quietly as she could, very grateful that she'd left night lights on throughout, as without them she'd be stumbling around awkwardly in the darkness, especially when her unyielding body was not being terribly cooperative. The soft blue lighted illumination from the night lights helped her to navigate her way around the furniture, without stumbling awkwardly into anything. She needed to be very quiet, so that whoever was in the house would be caught off guard. She was the one that needed to surprise them, not the other way round. "'Call the police! Call the police!' was the shrill voice that rang inside her head, like a clamorous loud bell. "'For God's sake! Call the police!' But she didn't listen to the voice in her head but tiptoed from one room to another. When she was satisfied no one was in the house, she breathed a huge sigh of relief. All that she needed to do was to close the front door behind her, bolting it safely. Was it possible she hadn't closed it properly, and left it slightly ajar, so that it blew open on its own accord? But I'm sure I closed it properly, she told herself. She ambled towards the front door, and stumbled over a crumpled heap lying on the floor. She let out a shrill scream. So there we are. That is part one. Part two is tomorrow night. Until next time, goodbye and good night.